I suppose I should start by just welcoming you, Dean Crowell. We won't go through your resume, but thank you for making yourself for, to welcome uh, speakers. So I'm handing it over to Dean Crowell. All right. Well, it is really nice to see everyone. Um, and I appreciate all the work you've done, uh, Professor Andrews, to put this wonderful program together entitled A Conversation to Consider the Legacy of Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. Um, as Professor Andrews said, I'm Anthony Crow. I'm the Dean and President here at the Law School, and it's a, a true pl a pleasure and privilege to welcome you to this very important event that we're holding during Black History Month, which for uh, Americans has been a federally recognized celebration since 1976, and certainly a critical reminder that Black history is American history. Today's program is a vital part of this celebration as well as South Africa's history and events have shaped racial relations and concepts of justice and reconciliation throughout the world and especially the US. I'm really proud of the work that New York Law School has done with the South Africa Reading Group and in its racial justice project, which Professor Andrews directs, um, which is part of our Wolf Center, uh, Wolf Impact Center for Public Interest Law, which is directed by Professor Rick Marsico, who's also here with us. And I wanna acknowledge the presence of our academic Dean William LaPiana. All of them along with the great faculty are deeply committed uh, to racial justice. And uh, today's program is just one example of that. Archbishop Tutu was at the forefront of one of the most important and historic uh, moments of in our time and was a tremendous advocate for freedom and justice in the 20th century. He dedicated his life to ending uh, apartheid and once it ended serving as a key leader in navigating a way forward to understand and take account of the horrific legacy of apartheid while guiding whites and blacks to be able to live together as equals. As chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he placed most of his emphasis on restorative justice. This became a foundation for an approach to justice in South Africa that could facilitate long-term healing and unity instead of just engaging in immediate punitive actions and retribution. The symbol and example of someone who struggled for so long to end such an unjust and oppressive system, becoming a leader in creating a new society where the oppressed and oppressors could coexist and live together has inspired new approaches to justice around the world. That is especially true for our profession today where many, including a number of our own faculty, are using concepts of restorative justice to establish a more fair and humane system here in New York and throughout our nation. There's so much else to learn from Archbishop Tutu's legacy in life and MYLS is extraordinarily fortunate to have Professor Penny Andrews lead this discussion. As many of you know, she's one of the world's most a preeminent legal scholars of South Africa and the director of our racial justice project. She's also led institutions of legal education on both sides of the ocean, serving as Dean and President of Albany Law School and also at the University of Cape Town Faculty of Law. In other words, there's no one better to unpack the legacy of Archbishop Tutu or to tackle domestic and international issues surrounding racial injustice. With that, I hand this back over to Professor Andrews and I look forward to a truly enlightening and important discussion today. Penny. Thank you, Dean Kral. Thank you for your gracious comments and also your willingness to make yourself available to welcome people. I want to reiterate what you've, the people you have welcomed, the individuals, and also thank the audience um, for joining this discussion. Um, I also want to, of course, welcome uh, the, my co-moderator Stephanie Erdan, you'll hear from her in a little bit, and I do want to thank our panelists uh, for taking the time to discuss um, uh, the legacy and explore the legacy of Archbishop Tutu. It's always difficult with Black History Month to choose a topic because there are so many things we could talk about and so many people we could honor. But the reason why I thought that this project might be a good one for um, this particular, for 2022 Black History Month, is to consider two parts of um, Archbishop Tutu's legacy, as Dean Crowell mentioned, restorative justice and also Ubuntu. We live in such divided times and where there's so much incivility and lack of kindness 
And I thought that it would be good to us to explore um, Archbishop Tutu's legacy through the notion of Ubuntu. But what I've asked the people who have um, agreed to be on the panel, um, Dr. Green, uh, Dr. Jones, Ms. McLean and Schlapo, um, I've asked them to be, because they have a, they've worked closely with uh, uh, Archbishop Tutu, have a strong connection to him, but also ex will explore Ubuntu, not in a sanitized way, but really thinking creatively about what the legacy of Archbishop uh, Tutu is, and particularly with respect to Ubuntu. What we are going to do is Stephanie and I are going to um, ask the, uh, the panelists a few questions. So this will be in the form of a conversation. And then we will open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, the only request I have uh, of you in the audience is that you uh, keep your questions brief so that we can have um, as much participation as possible. So like, right now I'd like to hand over uh, to uh, Stephanie Erdang. Thanks, Penny. Um, the word Ubuntu has become so familiar to us that many don't remember or know that it was the archbishop who was the champion and early promoter of the concept as a principle to live one's life by, connected as we are to each other through being members of a community. The word Ubuntu and the concept behind it originated amongst South Africans and Guni people who included the Zulu and the Corsa. It can be translated as a person is a person through other people. Let me quote the archer's own words. Africans believe in something that is difficult to render in English. We call it Ubuntu. It means the essence of being human. You know when it's there, and when it's absent. It speaks about humanness, gentleness, hospitality, putting yourself out on behalf of others. It embraces compassion and toughness. It recognizes that my humanity is bound up in yours, for we can only be human together. He goes on to explain that for far too often, people think of themselves as just individuals separated from one another. Whereas we are connected and what we do affects the whole world. Bringing people together is what I call Ubuntu, which means I am because we are. It is a set of principles on which the arch based his life, a philosophy that he embraced. And for this, we are forever grateful. Thanks, Penny. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, so what I'd like to do is ask the first question of all the uh, uh, panelists, and we'll go in uh, alphabetical order. And this is my question to you. Uh, could you tell us about your connection or your relationship or your engagement uh, with Archbishop Tutu and one or two lessons that you learned from him? So we'll start with you, Pippa. We'll, I'm just going to be on first name terms here, if it's okay. Pippa, we'll start with you, and then we'll go on to Robert and then Charlotte. Sure. Thanks, Penny. I, I should point out I'm not a doctor, though, just in case. That we oh, can okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, you know, I, I met him. I got to know him really in the late 80s. I'd come back from New York where I was living and studying at Columbia at the time. And John Allen, who had been a religious religion reporter on the star, had covered him extensively. And when he became Archbishop in 1986, he, um, he, he went to work for him full time and asked me, I had a small baby then, and he asked me to go and work for him two days a week, editing a kind of a newsletter. I was doing freelance journalism. And during, I mean, it was a very tumultuous time that, you know, 1989, it was a time of, it, it was really the year that everything shifted and everything changed. And I spent a lot of time with him then, including at, you know, political funerals, ANC funerals. And then I, th I think that what was the turning point in South African history was the peace march that he led in on 13th of September, 1989. And I can speak a little bit about what led up to that later. Um, my, my encounters, my connection with him, you know, kind of went on after I, you know, got other jobs and moved into sort of full-time journalism. But the last time that I sat down with him 
for any length of time was in a, a series of podcast interviews we did on the Truth Commission called History for the Future, when I interviewed all the tr ex-Truth Commissioners on the 25th anniversary of the human rights, of the, the first human rights hearing. And that was 2016. And he, he was quite extraordinary in the, in the sense of his clarity about looking back and some of the criticisms of the Truth Commission and the settlement now saying that that in fact one had to know what apartheid was like to appreciate what happened afterwards and i'll put a link to that on the on the chat group and then maybe speak a little bit more about how he strategized in 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 a way that even the internal anti-apartheid leaders were not strategizing to actually lead to a big breakthrough when de Klerk became president is there any one or one lesson that you've learned from the arch? Always say thank you when somebody sends you something. He wrote letters. He sent me, you know, when I got the Neiman Fellowship in 1998, 97, 98, he'd send me flowers. He'd send me flowers for my birthday. Um, he, he, he was extremely courteous all the time, but he was also... Um, yeah, he, th there was one thing that, you know, in the, you know, after his, after his death and before the funeral, um, the, there, there was one lesson I did learn, but not from myself, from Michael Weeder, who's the Dean of St. George's Cathedral. And it was from his assistant who, when Michael Weeder was going to travel with him to Europe and the States for the first time, and his assistant, Lavinia, said to him, you know, everybody, but everybody is going to try and convince you that they're the archer's best friend. But remember, he yeah. only has one best friend, and that's Mama Leo. So I learned that about him as well. Thank you. Thank you, Pip. So you were not one of these 1,000 best friends. No, I was very privileged to know him and to interact with him, but I, yes. never, I never assumed I was his best friend. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Well, let me just start by saying, first of all, what a tremendous honor and privilege it is for me to have an opportunity to uh, participate in what I call this critical conversation about the life and legacy of mm -hmm. someone that I've admired for a very long time. I came to know Archbishop Tutu basically because one of those uh, uh, innovative ideas that probably most people don't remember about him, but way back in the late 1970s, about 77 or 78, uh, Archbishop Tutu started to think about what was going to be needed in a post-apartheid South Africa. And the thing that he settled on was the fact that at that time, there was probably less than 3,000 college-educated Black South Africans, and he knew that that was going to be insufficient to be able to lead the country post-apartheid. So he came to the US, approached the World Bank, uh, IIE, a uh, lot of uh, multinational corporations that were doing business in South Africa and approached them to start to work to create a multi-million dollar fund that was designed to educate black South African students in American university with the primary goal of preparing for post-apartheid. And let me put the tagline in now, it worked beautifully. And I'll give you some examples as I go on. And so that started in about 1978. And then about 1984, I got this call from the vice president at University of Minnesota, who the president at that time, C. Peter McGraw, was on the national council for this South African education program that was uh, headed by this guy named uh, Derek Bach, who I think some of you have heard of. And my president of the University of Minnesota was on that national advisory committee. And they had been operating for about three or four years. And much to their surprise, they found that, that a lot of the students were interested in science. They had no one on the team with a scientific background. And so I was asked to consider uh, becoming the scientific consultant for Tutu South African Education Program. It uh, was supposed to be a two-year commitment and uh, I ended up doing it for more than a decade. And uh, via that process, I first met uh, who, uh, he was an archbishop at that time. I met him at Kotsa House when he was secretary general of South African Council of Churches. 
His office was uh, just above the South African Education Program office. And he also served on the National Council for the South African Education Program. To put it succinctly, this program, uh, out of more than 12, 15,000 applications every year, I was co-leading a team that went across South Africa and Namibia to select 125 students each year to study in American universities. And that through that process, after about four or five, six weeks, we would gather in Johannesburg uh, for the national selection process that uh, Archbishop Tutu was the chair of. And so that's how I got to know him uh, was focusing on what I know best, and that is higher education. And through that process, we uh, uh, educated between three and 4,000 South African students in American universities. And uh, it is clearly, IIE will tell you, the most successful international program, education program in history. It had a return rate, even during apartheid, that was more than 98%. Uh, people wanted to come back to South Africa and I can tell you in some small way, I take great satisfaction in knowing that via that program, I was able to contribute under the leadership of Archbishop Tutu to ending apartheid through education. And my remark about it working, I have returned to South Africa several times since that first trip in 1984. I have not made a trip to South Africa where I have not ran into several people who in high leadership positions, whether in corporate or in nonprofit, managing directors, higher education, who uh, I have can't go back there without many, several people who benefited and graduated from that program. Clearly the most powerful, impactful thing that I've done across my 43 years in higher education. And so that was my first interaction with them. And just briefly, uh, we connected uh, again in about 2003, I think it was, when I was asked by the university to invite somebody that I worked with that had a national, if not global, profile because the university had started this thing called Critical Conversation. And so um, I threw out some people in the music industry. Some of you know I dabble in the music professionally as well. But then we settled on Archbishop Tutu. Had no idea that he would agree to do it. He was on leave at the uh, North Florida University, University of Northern Florida in Jacksonville. So the office called him up and invited him to come have this critical conversation with me. He initially said no, because as you know, he was having some health issues at the time. He called back within hours and said, no man, I changed my mind. Uh, he's the only person I allowed to call me Bob. He said Bob was very helpful for, uh, to me during apartheid and the South African education program. I will do it for him. Anyway, long story short, he flew into campus. We had about an hour conversation before the critical conversation. This was standing room only. That place only held 5,000 people. It must have been six. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my lifetime. And everything you know or read about Archbishop Tutu came to life in terms of his deep thinking we talked about the South African education program. We talked about the truth and reconciliation here. Uh, he was just absolutely amazing. And it, I was really panicking at the last minute, how am I gonna have a conversation with Desmond Tutu in front of five or 6,000 people? And finally, after I met with them in the green room before the event, I walked back to my office and said, well, wait a minute, what are you worrying about? These folks are not coming to see you. All you've got to do is just point them in the right direction. That's exactly what happened. It was truly one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And just to end this, I became very good friend with his daughter, Naomi Tutu, who has uh, become a good friend of mine. And subsequently, my last interaction with him, or next to last after the Minnesota event, was when he spoke at my inauguration uh, when I became the president of State University of New York at Albany. And Penny, I know you remember it because you was there. That's and right. It surprised me with a virtual uh, remarks from him uh, because uh, Mama Layla would not allow him to travel to Albany uh, to participate live, but he did a video feed. And he, as you know, he had a great sense of humor. 
And he demonstrated that by telling the audience that, yes, I remember when I first met Bob and I asked him, why aren't you a university dean or president by now? And he said, Bob told me, well, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in that at all. And then he paused for a moment and he said, well, Bob, I guess God had other plans. So that's the end of my long story. Sorry for taking, sorry for taking so long, but what I remember most about him is his amazing thoughtfulness, that he cared about people. He was the embodiment of Mbutu, and he had this great sense of humor. Naomi used to comment about she hated to travel on the plane with him because he wouldn't stay in his seat. He'd always be up and down the aisle chatting people up. So thank you all for allowing me to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte. Thanks, Penny. So, you know, when I first encountered the Archbishop Tutu, um, I encountered him as the father of one of my really, really good friends, Nondombi Tutu. Both of our families lived in Lesotho at the time, and we all went to boarding school in, in Swaziland. And I remember as a teenager and being politically aware of the apartheid atrocities, going to a lecture by the Arch, who was at the time the Bishop of Lesotho. And on that occasion, he spoke to the University of Lesotho Netherlands Hall, to an absolute packed hall with no room standing. And I remember my young self being completely mesmerized by his oratory, by his message of humanity, and his ability to not lose sight of its ugly flip side of indignity and exclusion. I was completely awed by how he commanded the respect of what 400 students that sat laser focused on every word he spoke. And so even at that early age, I was, it was very clear to me that he had chosen to use his voice and the pulpit to bring attention to the evils of apartheid and, and to use that to mobilize those that he met and to ensure that they acted. So throughout my life, I would intersect with his brilliance and his compassion of course, it was his role as uh, the chair of the human of the South Africa of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I later became a commissioner on the South African Human Rights Commission, and the TRC was a really important time in our nation's history. The TRC crisscrossed the country with hearings that were unearthing evidence of heinous crimes of apartheid, and they met in small town halls. What was really important was that the hearings were broadcasted on public television. And I have to say that while the TRC was not without its issues, it did bring to the fore the pain and the suffering endured by so many South Africans. And I think a really important aspect related to that was that the TRC debunked this notion of possible erasure of an ugly and racist past and made it really difficult for people to glibly say, they were not aware of the heinous crimes of the racist apartheid government or its impact on people. And you know, the nation sat transfixed to our screens, or in many instances, listening to radios for months on end as the arch presided over harrowing accounts of great loss and violence brought on by apartheid. And in his masterful manner, the arch showed us great steer. He showed us compassion and he showed us vulnerability. We will all remember the iconic moment when he wept on screen, cupping his head into his hands. For me, that remains a truly profound moment. It was as if he was weeping for the entire nation. His humanity and integrity were foregrounded in his beliefs and as, if, and as others have said, in his philosophy of Ubuntu. After the TRC concluded that its hearings, it was indeed the Arch who relent relentlessly pushed to have the TRC reports released to the public because he saw the value of building a shared history, even if it was a very painful one. Never the bystander, the Arch intervened on principal issues, even when those interventions were not popular. And so for example, and I remember vividly, 
the arch statement that was presented at the World Con Conference of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerances, which I attended in Durban in 2001. And that statement drew some consternation from certain quarters. But the arch stood steadfast in his conviction, and the statement was presented. Another example that I recall was the arch standing up to his beliefs of nonviolence was when he prevented the necklacing of an alleged police informer in Duduza, a township on the east side of Johannesburg. He intervened and he walked the talk. And so Penny, you asked the question earlier on, what are the lessons that I learned from the arch? I would say that there are many lessons, but two stand out particularly. The first one I would say is that I learned from the arch the importance of speaking truth speaking truth to power, even if, if, even if it's uncomfortable and an unpopular truth. He spoke his truth even when the consequences were perilous. I would say the second lesson is that of humility and openness to being vulnerable and never lo losing sight of our interdependence or, or our Ubuntu. And finally, I also learned about finding joy and laughter as an, as an important, a very important part of healing. And so the last thing I will say in terms of my intersecting uh, with the arch was that most recently, another connection has been that I have, been, I have joined a board of shared interest, a social investment nonprofit that the arch was an honorary member for for many years. So many intersecting points and many, many lessons learned. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, and thank you, Robert and Pippa. I'll hand over to Stephanie now. Okay, our first uh, question is for Dr. Jones. Uh, as we have acknowledged, the arch universalized the term Ubuntu, which has been associated with ideas of restorative justice. You, as the chancellor of a large campus, must confront many instances that require reference to Ubuntu. How do you think we can incorporate the concept in, in the ways that our institutions operate, especially here in the USA, where we are so divided in so many ways how would Ubuntu feature in our institutions, especially in its operations? Thank you. Well, Stephanie, let me start by saying I, I think this is a very critically important and, and timely question, because I think uh, all of us that are around higher education would agree that uh, notwithstanding COVID, uh, we still have to navigate that. But we're in one of the most difficult periods that I've observed in 43 years of higher education, where a lot of the, the gains that were achieved in this country in the 60s and a lot of the, uh, the advances that we've made in race relations all have come into justice, uh, come, come into greater focus and a sense of loss particularly in the aftermath of all of the police-involved shootings that have transpired, a number of which were in my home state of Georgia, as well as in the place that I still call home, which is Minnesota. And it is really against that backdrop and against all of the uh, social issues and uh, social injustice issues that are starting to play out on our college campuses where our students are really greatly concerned about the state of affairs, they're concerned about the sustainability, they're concerned about the environment. And so I think as we think about how do we lead and how do we educate our students, I'm a firm believer that a part of the educational experience occurs outside of the classroom. Uh, part of that educational experience has to embrace our absolute commitment to social justice and uh, preparing our young people to be uh, better citizens, uh, perhaps than some of our, uh, their parents or some of us are being today. So we're very big here on advocating for social justice and ending racism and intolerance. 
I think universities have a responsibility to acknowledge the fact that uh, a lot of higher education institutions have been part of the problem. And so in the notions of Ubuntu, I think it's important for a university to acknowledge the existence of intolerance and injustice in higher education, and then to be very, very clear about taking deliberate steps to end that. And part of it has to be uh, along the notion, you no, know, we always focus on making sure our kids get leadership skill training. I can't tell you that the notion of forgiveness is not always incorporated into that notion of how you be an effective leader. And I can tell you, I have uh, observed far too often uh, this cancel culture that seems to be dominating and preventing real conversations and dialogue, the truth telling that we talked about earlier, you know, is, and I'm a fundamental believer. And I learned this during my early days in South Africa, where uh, you really have to put forth the extra effort. And I think this is what Archbishop Tutu and others were embodying. You really do have to take time out to understand the other if you want to really have reconciliation and if you want to move forward. That is counter to the cancel culture that predominates now where far too often on our universities, if you don't agree with me, then I'm done. I cancel you out and uh, I don't wanna hear your perspective. That is not a road to, to progress. It is not a good road to the future. So I think that needs to Go beyond where it's always been part of this university and others, restorative justice has always been a part of kind of the uh, student affairs, uh, student conduct process. I think that there's room for it across the entire institution as we think about the future, that uh, you know there has to be an opportunity to have a conversation. There has to be the way to tell the truth and reconcile uh, going forward. We've tried to embody some of those models. I've embraced my own uh, conversation here that we stole the idea from Minnesota. We have this uh, critical conversation dialogue series where we've tried to demonstrate to our students what it means to have opposite opinion, but yet be agreeable. And we've had uh, uh, Muhammad and Yoshi Klein Levy here engaging in a conversation about uh, issues of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. And so we're trying to embody this notion in terms of not only what we teach, but not only how we interface with students and student organizations, but also as we try to provide educational and dialogue opportunities outside of the classroom. Let me just say it is needed now, perhaps more so than any point in our history because we're on a path now, folks, that is actually, people ask me what keeps me up at night. This, this lack of respect and lack of telling the truth and having a truthful dialogue and the ability to listen and understand the other is a recipe for the decline in our society. And I just don't think that's hyperbole. I think it's real and it does causes me great concern. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, I'd like to address my question to um, Ms. McLean and Schlapo at this point um, and sort of talk about um, the Archer's legacy um, and also the legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in that both their legacies has to, have to some extent been sanitized um, because both, both their approaches to racial reconciliation included a focus on social and economic justice locally and globally. So that's a far more radical stance than just the elimination of racial discrimination. So I wonder if you can sort of talk about um, why do you think, there, what's the reasons for this quote unquote whitewashing as people have described it? And, and how can we appreciate their legacies in a more authentic way beyond the sort of saint-like qualities, particularly, you know, uh, 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 th th this month I've seen lots of references to the, you know, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and that message of, um, you know, his radical message is often lost. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. 
Thanks, Penny. And, and that's a really big question. Uh, and one that I think will be studied for many years to come. But I suspect it was a combination of his reach, his charismatic and joyous persona, his ability to really capture audiences and unleash his moral authority that was kind of unshakable. I mean, he, it was bolstered by the fact that he had been named the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and he had this unrelenting struggle for justice and for human dignity for all people. And again, I'll go back to my earlier point that the Archer's radical stance, I think, was really that he spoke truth to power. His voice and truth were very much his weapons and he was not afraid to step up where there was a void he spoke up and he showed up. And he did this because he understood the indignities of apartheid and he used his stature to mobilize South Africans in South Africa, but very much the global community. His unequivocal condemnation of apartheid, we will all remember Arch making a compelling case for sanctions against the apartheid regime and very importantly around divestment in, in South, from South Africa. Perhaps one of the issues that has brought on these attempts to whitewash his legacy was that the arch taught us that it's not possible to be a neutral bystander. And he once said, and I quote, those who turn a blind eye to injustice actually perpetuate injustice. If you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. So, I mean, I think those kind of articulations really made us think. But ultimately, I think what's important about the arch was that his approach was not to condemn people, even if it was the oppressor, but rather he chose to hold those who had perpetuated crimes against humanity accountable and focus on addressing structural and systemic oppression. And I think this really came about when you know, his time as the chair on the TRC, he advocated for forgiveness, but he talked about forgiveness as an essential step towards healing and a pathway and stressed this point that it was a pathway to social and economic justice and peace. He saw forgiveness as an important step to healing a nation that as we know was emerging from a very difficult and dark past. Um, and the arch spoke not only about forgiveness, but insisted on accountability and reparations. So his struggles for justice, I would say, were not static. And I think this is a really important point about the arch. His struggle for justice was not based on a single narrative. It was complex, it was robust. And while the arch is typically known for his global work on um, the freedom and dismantling apartheid, he certainly carried the fight beyond apartheid. More recently, he saw the urgency of tackling climate change. He spoke candidly about the morality of profits being made from the rising temperatures, sea and human suffering caused by the burning of fossil fuels. He was strongly committed to women's rights, to LGBT, Q plus rights to the rights of Palestinian people. He called out inaction around addressing HIV and AIDS in, in, in South Africa and was a very strong global voice on this issue. He was very outspoken about the corruption um, of the democratic uh, government. In 2013, he flagged to the then President Obama the need to close Guantanamo Bay Detention Center. And so I think the Arch's holistic view of a just and principled struggle that was rooted in human rights was one that he positioned as requiring to change, to have structural change in our society. And I believe that this was quite uncomfortable for the privileged and for the status quo. His Words was really powerful. And he once said he would rather go to hell than to go to homophobic heaven. And he went on to say, if God, as they say, is homophobic, I wouldn't worship that God. 
Now, I don't know too many African religious leaders that have openly supported gay rights and equality in such uncertain terms. And so the Arch's unflinching commitment to equality for all, justice and accountability, made him very much a thorn in the side of leaders that either oppressed or corroded the fundamental freedoms of their people. He was a stark reminder to them of the work that had not yet been done. Another important feature of the Arch was that he actioned his beliefs. We've heard about the scholarship funds that he put in place for young South Africans and Africans. There was the Desmond Tutu um, HIV Foundation and he lent his name to many other action oriented causes that fundamentally address issues around social and economic equality. His skills and conviction to speak truth to power might be one of those reasons why there are attempts, and, and I put that in quote, to whitewash his legacy. And as we all know, there have been some instances of vilification, but that never stopped the arch, did it? He continued to be the beacon of hope, the arch that influenced Miles Davis to write the track Tutu, which ironically caused a stir amongst jazz purists. But the arch was there for the people. He was with the people. And the arch reminded us and those in power that their work was not yet done. And I believe that that was the power and that might be one of the reasons um, the attempts to whitewash him were in place. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, the next question is for Pippa. Since his death, President Mandela's legacy has been contested in South Africa with strong critiques from young activists in particular. So Pippa, do you see the legacy of the arch being contested in the same way? You know, I think, I think South Africa is a very contested place at the moment. And in fact, in that interview that I put on the chat, the link to it, I asked him well, the question about Mandela in particular. And his answer was, you know, um, and I have to hear his voice, you know, it, the whole time in, in my head. Had you been there, he said, you would have known that the black community was encamped. You're not a sellout if you spend 27 years in jail, if you commander in chief of Nkonto was seized with. And I think that that was, you know, there was also a narrative that the TRC was some sort of sellout as well. But if you read the report and look at the, and what government had said it would do and what it failed to do in the wake of the TRC, it wasn't the TRC that was the problem. But I do think that there's going to be a narrative that, you know, that there was something odd about him, but it's or, or kind of slightly soft about him. But I really agree with Charlotte. He was he, he, his narrative and the way he intervened was was robust. So he the 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 C triple A, which was passed in eighty six, right? You know, was very much a part of his work, and it was a time in South Africa when it was actually an offence under the Terrorism Act to promote sanctions and call for sanctions, in which he did. He also alienated a lot of his own congregation in the, in the Anglican church for doing that, but stood by it. And I think that it was the only time, John Allen, his biographer, writes that it was the only time that when Re Reagan, as I recall, was vetoed twice on, on, on that bill. So it was passed. And it's the only time in history where a president has been vetoed twice. I may be wrong, that's what John wrote. But his combination of the... Um, of his strategic sense of when to intervene and how to how to drive a campaign and really uh, it, it wasn't an aura I mean his religion was very real and very and very deep within him but it was the combination of that that I think made him made him so special and there is no way uh, that um, that in terms of what he did in terms of how he intervened at particular times that his legacy you know cannot hold up and just one last point on on the on the legacy you know he called a, a lot of the people who are zuma supporters broadly now the previous president who has been you know who's facing corruption charges and all manner of things and 
his supporters seem to be behind the great July sort of unrest that happened in two provinces in, in South Africa, is he, he really called Zuma out, you know, quite a long time ago for, for corruption. And when they, when, when the government refused to give a, a visa to the Dalai Lama to come to, I think his 80th birthday, he said he was very angry and he said, I'm going to pray just as I prayed for the downfall of the apartheid government, I'm going to pray for the downfall of the ANC government if this is how they behave. So he is very, um, you know, his, 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 his legacy, I think, is really, is really cast in, in history, but the people who are the detractors are part of a reflection of the South African political milieu today and the contestations over over power and over, quite frankly, over corruption. Thank you, thank Thanks. you, Pippa. Um, I, I, you know, we could continue and I, I, we do have more questions, Stephanie and I, but there've been a few people who've put, uh, you know, uh, contacted me about us raising questions. I do want to sort of call on some people and I think I'll start, Zubeda Jaffa, who's a journalist from Cape Town, is on the line and she's put something on chat Zubeda, do you want to give us a summarized uh, version of the question for the panelists? And you've got to unmute yourself, Zubeda. Hello, Penny and everybody. I thought I was supposed to just write the question in the chat, which I will be thought in the chat, but seeing that you want me to repeat it, um, I was very thrilled with Dr. Jones's point. Um, uh, about, about the way in which we interact with one another and the way in which we talk, talk have public discourse. And uh, it, it's so, you know, it's such a, it's such a level of incivility that it's frightening. And if you think of the next generation, if you think that they are watching this and observing this, what are they learning? They are learning that this is the way in which you, you, we, you, know, you disagree or you, you, you debate. And um, the arch, I always over the years watched and observed the arch very, very closely uh, in how he formulated these objections and how he said that, how he was able to object without, you know, he wasn't playing the man. He was, he was kicking the ball. I'm not sure if that's a, I, I, you get what I'm, the drift of what yes, I'm saying. Yes, yes. And so you raise, you, well, your question really is about the, what to do to reverse the trend. My... Zubaida? Yeah, it's, it's yes. breaking up, so... so yes, I'll ask Dr. Do... Jones, too, because you, you're breaking a little bit, but yes. I think your question was directed to Dr. Jones. Yes, and anybody else. Anybody, uh, okay. All right, any of the panelists, but we'll start with you, Robert. Well, let, let me uh, say again, as I said earlier, you know, I do think that this is an existential threat to all of society. If we're going to be moving to a society where you, and I've seen it play out on this campus and other campus, where young leaders are afraid to be very open about their position for fear of being canceled. I mean, what kind of educational experience that is leading to and what kind of outcomes are gonna be on the back end of this 10, 15 years from now? If our students haven't had the opportunity to have respectful dialogue and debate across a very wide array of issues, and if this counterculture, I'll call it that of cancellation, becomes the way that they are accustomed to living life and having discourse, it, it doesn't go well for, for humanity in the years to come if this becomes a dominant narrative. And so in every opportunity that I have through our critical conversation series, through how we try to work with student organizations, I had the first uh, black lieutenant governor uh, for the state of Illinois to come talk to a group of student leaders uh, because a lot of this has been playing out in what we call our student government association. And so it's the place where they should be learning civility. And I know that's a bad word here, so don't tell anybody I said that, but it's, it's uh, it, how do you learn 
as uh, Ubuntu, you know, I am human because you are human. How do you help other people understand the fragility of humanity, particularly if you are not able to have a conversation about subjects that you may not be on the same page, but how do you have a respectful conversation? Because as again, I remember the first thing, one of the things I read as I was preparing to make my first trip to South Africa in 1984, was a piece about understanding the other and how critically important that was. I can't remember the author, but that tagline, that, that phrase has stuck with me all of my life. And I think it's the embodiment of what we're seeing playing out in the world today, where we have a generation of students who have, are not being educated about the notion of critical discourse how do you frame a compelling argument, but then how do you listen to the kind of argument? Not that it may not always change your perspective, but it will change your mind and your viewpoint, but it should broaden your perspective. And I just think that we're at a very critical juncture here and that each and every one of us have a responsibility to try to fight against this growing cancer culture uh, to the notion that uh, we need to try to understand the other uh, as a way of really being human and protecting the, the very fragile humanity that we have existing today. So I don't know how else to put it other than that. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Stephanie? Yes, yeah, so there's another question from the audience from Donna Katzen. Hi, Donna. Uh, Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, what an amazing panel this is, and thank you so much for convening us all to be part of it. Um, the Arches' emphasis on restorative justice is one of the more prophetic dimensions, as people have said, of his legacy. And he would put it so simply, he would say, someone can take my pen and say, Father, I apologize, I will never take your pen again, I promise. But the question ultimately is, will you give me back my pen? And uh, so Dr. Jones has talked uh, a lot about what this means in the context of education, but my question more broadly is for the Arches restorative justice agenda, for the part of his agenda that challenged institutions and systems that keep people poor and powerless, what are the practical messages that we can take forward uh, in this time. The arch was a prophet. Prophets are prickly. We know that they're not always loved, but this message is so critical on so many levels. People think about individual change and associate reconciliation with the arch. What do we do with the systemic imperatives of restorative justice? Thank you, Donna. Economic imperative. Charlotte, why don't we have you respond and then maybe uh, Pippa and, and Robert can answer as well. Yeah, so I mean, just on the first on Zubeda's question, and great to see you, Zubeda. Um, I mean, I think there's really value in us writing our stories and, and creating and, and making sure that we have our history articulated. I think that's a really important piece of, of shaping the dialogue. Um, and then I think creating those spaces, those safe spaces where people can have dialogue and have different perspectives and be respectful. Uh, is, is really important. On some of the practical messages to take forward, I mean, I think for me, a lot of the Arches work was rooted fundamentally in human rights. Um, and I think that that's a really important way to take forward this, his, his legacy, to ensure that rights are in fact being implemented, that we're doing justice to human rights, that we're looking at the whole gamut of rights, including social and economic rights. Because I think once we're able to do that, we can then begin to address some of the systemic issues. And we're still not, we're, we're very far from being there. There are still lots of governments that don't recognize social and economic rights. So I do think that that's a fundamental part of what we can do to, to find ways to operationalize this, this, this philosophy for me means using a rights approach to drive to driving change and addressing systemic inequality. Thank you. Pepper and then Robert, do you have any response? Can you just 
just briefly i mean i think that the i think that what he combined was this approach of human rights for you know which included as charlotte has said everybody um most unusually in in africa but it was also combined with this this extraordinary strategic sense so for instance in in that that what, what I think the, the, the march that changed the history of the country of South Africa in, 80, in September 89, it came in the wake of a whole lot of marches that had been quite brutally suppressed. The beach protests, which he began as soon as de Klerk became acting president. P.W. Boerter was still the actual president, but de Klerk was acting president. And if you those who were old enough who were around at the time will recall how people were um, you know, so there was a protest of the um, activists who went to two beaches, they were beaten up, they were arrested, etc. When Archbishop Tutu went to Bloberg Strand, the second beach, he asked the police to borrow their loud, loud hailer, because things were getting very tense. And as he said, he said, I don't think they were over keen, but they gave it to me. And um, he got everyone to sing the national anthem. Well, of course, he's sick then and got people to go home and so protected them. So by the time, the, when the last white elections happened, there were protests in the townships and 13 people died. And the UDF was then prepared to just retreat. You know, they said that we'd been so battered and so beaten up that we, that we actually need to retreat. He went into his chapel for two days and didn't see anyone. And he said he prayed and he came out and he said, we must have this peace march. And a lot of them said, you know, Father, you're crazy. We're going to get, we're going to get hammered at this march. But he also knew that there had been huge pressure of the American, the, 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 I think it was like Wolpe and Lugar and a bunch of people had gone to the Europeans and started putting huge pressure on them to put sanctions on South Africa. So when that march happened, de Klerk called him before and said, will you apply for a permit? And he said, no. He said, as long as the police keep their hands in their pockets, we'll be fine. That day, 30,000 people walked from St. George's Cathedral to the parade. And it was the first time he used the expression, the rainbow nation. And it was the day that really changed everything because three weeks later or a month later, the Ravonia trialists, except for Mandela came out, were released from prison and the emergency restrictions were basically lifted. And de Klerk became acting president, I mean, proper president a week later. So there was a, a strategic sense that I don't think that we, we sometimes people appreciate about him, but they also that we don't see in a lot of leaders today who are trying to get things done. They, so they, that was the big combination for me and the kind of his, the, the unique contribution that he made was that strategic sense of how to get the timing right to do things. Thank you, Pippa. Um, and you had your hand up. And I know Rebecca Carey, who's the Racial Justice Fellow, also had a hand up. So why don't we start with you, Anne, and then we'll go to Rebecca. Oh, thank you. Oh, very sorry, much. Uh, 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 Dr. Jones, did you want to? We'll get you to answer the next the next question. No, I'm fine. Thank you. I thought yeah. the answers were brilliant, and I fully agree. They were spot on. Thank you very much, uh, Penny. I'm learning so much uh, from all of you, and you know, my head is practically spinning with some of these things. So the question I'd like to pose uh, connects uh, the question of history and, uh, and truth. And um, it's my impression that there was um, a, a certain amount, perhaps a great deal of suppression of history uh, in apartheid. And we're beginning to experience this in the United States right now. Uh, numerous states have enacted laws that uh, really prohibit the teaching of racial history in, in public schools and even public universities. Um, and a, a big question is, how are we going to get past this? Uh, and I'm, I'm very curious about the experience uh, in South Africa of uh, opening up the truth that could be the basis of, of truth and reconciliation. Thank you, Anne. Well, Robert, we'll start with you and then move on again to Charlotte and Pippa. Well, let me start by saying, Anne, thank you for being very clear about what I was alluding to in, in my broad remarks. Uh, this is the piece, you know, having grown up 
as a son of a sharecropper in southwestern Georgia, having lived and educated in a Jim Crow environment, and having to uh, see now what's going on in this country, you know, the uh, really concerted effort to disenfranchise the, 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 the voting rights and privileges of people in select states across this country really is a significant threat to democracy. And I am very, very troubled by it. I'm fortunate enough to be in a state that I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, getting uh, terminated or fired uh, because of uh, the, our part of our core uh, curriculum here that we adopted several years ago is to make sure that our students take classes to understand the historical context of race and racism. And the notion that someone thinks it's okay to, to not teach the history of slavery and segregation in this country because of some a term that I, I have to admit, I was puzzled by it when I first heard, heard about it, this notion of white fragility. I just have difficulty to get my arms around what that really means. And how is all of society, whether you're white or whatever your race or ethnicity might be, how am I better off? How are my children better off if we have systematically denied to educate them about history and about the atrocities of history? And as an old axiom about if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. I think it's even worse than that. You're bound to really perpetuate other atrocities that are worse than the ones that uh, have a historical context. This is one of the other threats that we face in this country. And one of the threats that I think my colleagues in higher and higher education are spending a lot of time these days in having discussions about what is the role of universities and pushing against this narrative and how perpetuating things that are, you know, we've gone from truth and reconciliation in South Africa to promote, promoting and, and trying to promote a narrative where lies and misinformation is somehow another normalized. That's a very slippery slope for our society to be on. And I think there are a lot of us in higher education that feel very strongly that just like we have to be on the side of ending racism and social injustice, we do have to push back against any concerted attempt to dictate what universities should be educating and should be teaching as a way uh, of carrying out our true mission of teaching, research, and, ser and service. And we have very clear principles about this as relates to our scholarship. You know, I can't sit and tell a professor what to do and I can't tell them what to teach. They're very clear guidelines, but now the notion that somehow another a state can dictate that it's a very slippery slope, not just for higher education, but I think for all of the citizens in every state and every country across this great world of ours. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte? Really not much to add from what Robert said. I, I mean, I just think that, you know, for the context of South Africa, it's, again, I think it's really important that people write the history, um, that we teach the history that we insist on telling the narratives um, that, that, that have existed, right? Um, and, and I think there is, there is a chance that we begin to lose sight of that. Um, and, I, and I do worry about that. And so, I mean, it's, for me, it's really important to make sure that young writers are thinking about this, that they're combing through the TRC reports, that they're writing it up, even if they disagree, it's really about developing that space where people can come and think differently, but we can't forget the history. I mean, that would be so, such a huge mistake. Um, so I just, I hope that we'll continue to see bright lights coming out and people writing and, and having these spaces to, to further discuss. But yeah, I mean, I think Robert said it all. Thank you. Pippa, do you have anything to add or should we go to the... Just to say very quickly, I mean, I really agree with Dr. Jones, but I don't, I want to, I haven't been in the States for three years, but I, I'm, I think that the, 
that South Africa does a much better job of dealing with its history than the United States does in my, you know, perhaps uneducated view. I'm amazed that there hasn't been that slavery is something that is that is a kind of a, a niche study, you know, that it's not evident in the society, that what happened to indigenous people is never spoken about. That the, you know, the roots, America is a country built on genocide and slavery, and they kind of all conveniently forget it. And particularly with the politics under Trump. And I see the Texas school libraries have just banned that book, Mouse, that, you know, the graphic novel about, about, uh, about the Holocaust. I, I, find it, I find it appalling that, um, that there are more people not standing up and saying, this, this is what your country is. This is what our country is built on. In a sense, I think we are doing a better job in South Africa of dealing with history. My two cents were, sorry. Uh, uh, somebody, I know, I know that uh, Rebecca has a question, but Gay McDougall is put, <laughs> also a, a, a sister from Georgia, put up a, a hand very strongly there, Gay. Do you, do you want to unmute yourself and quickly respond to Pippa's point and, and Anne's question? Well, it's not a response to anything that's been said. I mean, I, I agree with everything that everybody has said. I just think that the tough question is not being grappled with. I mean, you know, uh, Desmond Tutu, who, who I um, uh, knew and worked with myself on political trials or, uh, throughout the uh, 80s, taught us to forgive. My mother taught me to forgive. It was a big thing in the black community to forgive, but it doesn't change the systems. We must speak the truth to power. How do you get the other side to listen? That's the question. And I think the, the, I, I think the critique that uh, of the TRC is that uh, it uh, must be elevated in giving a platform uh, for uh, South Africans, Black South Africans, to talk about uh, the grief, the torture, uh, the abuse. But who was listening? And so, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, we can, uh, we can talk about slavery. We can talk about Jim Crow. I lived through Jim Crow. We can uh, talk about uh, the history of the U.S. And yes, there are people who are trying to get us to stop doing that. But the question is, how do we get the other side to listen? To me, that's the fundamental question. Well, and you know, I spent my whole life working on these issues. Um, uh, of uh, racial discrimination in this country and around the world, including in South Africa, and have learned a tremendous uh, amount about uh, struggle. Um, and I think that the, the difference between uh, South Africa, PIPA, and the US in terms of confronting uh, the history of the question is that there was a real struggle for power in South Africa that changed the dynamic. And I mean, it was a, ma a majority. Here we're a tiny minority. And those who come and even come to speak about uh, the realities in their country, you know, quickly get uh, overlooked or, you know, uh, subsumed into the majority, et cetera. So that I think that's that that's that's the problem. Um, how do we get the other side to listen and to see power when we are such a man? Look at what's happened in uh, Congress yes. with the new um, uh, sort of what do they call it, the radical left, whatever you want to call it. They're not very radical, <laughs> but. Um, you know, that is sort of yelling into the darkness, but the power is on the other side. And it's not shaking just because I forgive them. How do we get the other side to see that this is in their interest when they are the majority and they hold all the power? 
and they control the economy. Thank you, Gay. Now, I, I, we, we, I want to continue this, but I want to be respectful of people's time. I know the Dean, we told the Dean and other people that we would stop at two. So what we're going to do is stop formally at two, but those of you, I just want to take a quick respond. Gay made such an important point. Response to Gay and also ask, have Rebecca ask a quick question, and then we, we should wrap this up at about 10 past because I have to teach at 2.15 and I'm sure other people have. <laughs> so let me formally thank Dean Crowell and thank Dean Lapiana and anybody else who are, you know, in the audience who have to leave now, I understand that, but can I ask the speakers and anybody to stay just for another 10 minutes? We'll continue the conversation. Thanks. All right, Rebecca, you wanna ask your last question? I see Larry also has, Larry, if you can ask a quick question, I'll take two quick questions and we'll have the panelists respond and then also respond to what Gay has, has, has raised. Right, so um, I'm really loving this discussion. I wish we could have more time. Um, I but... also wanna say that Rebecca is the Racial Justice Fellow at New York Law School mm -hmm. this year. Um, but my, there, I have so many questions, but the one that I settled on to ask was, um, so I'm someone who grew up in the South, was educated in the Southern United States. Um, we didn't, I didn't learn about apartheid in school. Um, I didn't learn about it till college. And even then it was still very limited. Um, and the only notable figure we learned about was Nelson Mandela. And so like, I mean, it's not, it shouldn't be shocking that there are other notable figures who took place, who like impacted the South African apartheid, but, um, I was hoping some of you, got, the panelists can recommend maybe one or two um, works by the Archbishop or by um, people, I think Pippa mentioned a, a biography that someone has written about him that um, I can take and give to my friends and that I myself can read to learn more about the Archbishop and the work that he did um, to end apartheid in South Africa and of all the other stuff that you guys have talked about. Thank you, Rebecca. I think what uh, Pippa can put the name of, Pippa mentioned the biographer of, of, of the arch. So maybe you can put that in the chat, Pippa, if that's okay. Uh, Larry, do you want to ask your quick question? You've got to unmute yourself, Larry. I, I was going to say, um, Pippa, what was your understanding? You know, obviously Archbishop Tutu, one of the things about him, he was so consistent. And when he was, you know, going to stand up for gay rights or Palestinian rights or criticize the ANC and Zuma, how did you think he saw post-apartheid South African politically? Do you think he, you know, he saw the ANC as changing or breaking up? What is your read on how he saw the political situation, particularly now post-Zuma? How do you think he saw it? Because obviously he was prepared to, he cared about South Africa more than any particular party. What's your understanding of where he thought about it the last few years? My, my sense is that well, when I spoke to him last, I, I saw him briefly at the 90th birthday service, but he wasn't really in a position to speak. But in 2016, it was the middle of the Zuma years, and he was appalled at Zuma. He was appalled at the public money spent on his house in Nkandla. That's actually turned out to be quite small sort of change compared to what we've learned subsequently about the corruption in the reports that have come out. I think that he, I think that he thought two things. I think that he thought that the constitution that we've got, which is one of the few in the world that endorses socioeconomic rights was something to be really proud of. But I think that he thought that the misgovernance, particularly after the Zuma years was a real break on development and was a betrayal of the people. I mean, he said, um, I can't remember the exact words he used, but he said, people don't, I think he said something like, our people deserve better than the government that they've got. So he was very critical because there are those systemic problems still and they, 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 they rooted in history, but they also rooted in, um, in bad governance as well. Thank I hope that for answers you, Mary. Thanks. So we're going to get uh, Robert to have the last word here. Uh, uh, Robert and, and Charlotte, unfortunately, had to go to another meeting, so she's left the, the, the room. Uh, well, uh, thank you. I'm not sure about the last word, but I have to address what Gay McDougall talked about. Uh, Gay, thank you for speaking truth to power, because your framework is the essence of 
where we stand. And one of the things I remember vividly about all of my trips to South Africa, particularly in the 80s, you know, I was always made to feel because I was Black and I was African American, you always run into people that always would start their conversation by where we're aspiring to be more like America and uh, have an experience more like Black America. And I would say, no, 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 no. You've got an opportunity to do much better than that. And I can tell you folks from where I sit, Gad, I think you would agree. Race relations in South Africa, a heck of a lot more advanced than they are in this country, particularly given what we are now seeing the undoing of a lot of the advances that we are experiencing. And your, your question is fundamentally, what can we do about it? We've got to do the same thing that we've done about it ever since the Voting Rights Act was passed. We've got to vote with our feet to push back against these narratives. Otherwise, folks, we are in deep trouble. And uh, maybe that's not appropriate for a university leader to say, but you, I'll say it again in any forum, we are in deep trouble. The democracy is in deep trouble. And so we now are in a position where we need to learn more from South Africa more from the leadership of your Nelson Mandela's and your Desmond Tutu and the other great people. Uh, I, I had uh, uh, Reverend Bulsack on my campus for in a very, very uh, brief period for, he was a visiting scholar here back in 2018. And he was just fundamentally in helping me to kind of have these conversations with our students, learning from uh, the apartheid era and how that can shape how we think about the future of this country. So um, we all know the narrative. We all know uh, how we ended up as a nation where there's a whole group of people that feel their privilege is, is being threatened. And that is what is driving a lot of the narratives that we see playing out. It's a, a society of growing members of society, many of which have been disenfranchised. But now given what's happening, it's uh, creating an environment that I do think is a significant threat on the advances that we've made as a nation, which means that it's a threat on the entire world as far as I'm concerned. Everybody around the world should be greatly concerned as we were about what was transpiring in South Africa and you hit on it, Gay. Uh, they're black and, and I mean black and not only in the traditional uh, color context, but in the South African context, people were in the majority. Not the case here, but it's the threat of underrepresented people, so-called minority people, coming into a majority that is the biggest driver of the nonsense we see playing out in this country at this point. Thank you, uh, Robert. I think we're gonna, I have to stop now because I, I have to go and teach. I want to particularly thank Stephanie, my co-moderator. I wanna thank you, Robert and Pippa. I know Pippa, it's nearly bedtime in, in Cape Town. Zubeda, okay, uh, uh, you know, beamed in from Cape Town and all of you in the audience, thank you so much. Palesa, thank you for posting the book on chat. Um, uh, Rebecca, there's some things on chat that's relevant to your questions. All of you who ask questions and this conversation it's an ongoing conversation. Uh, thank you for your intervention, Gay. Um, and I'll see you at the next South Africa Reading Group session. And I wish you all a good, good day and a good afternoon. Thank you as well, Zubaida, for, for beaming in. Bye. <laughs>